Okay, if you want to turn with me, we're going to get straight into Scripture. So for those of you that have joined us for the first time today, you're very welcome. And we're excited to seeing you release everything that God has placed in your heart to unleash the kingdom to our will. We're going to turn to Isaiah 45, sorry. Isaiah 45. Praise the Lord Jesus. Worthy he is, almighty God, you're worthy. Thank you for this opportunity to ask to these wonderful people, Lord. So humbled to teach your word. Grant me grace, God, to do it in a way that honors you. Do it in a way that doesn't set up obstacles or stumbling blocks. Give me grace, Father, to preach your word with clarity. In Jesus' name, move me out the way and let Christ shine. I pray, Lord, that you would give us all humble hearts this morning to just hear what your word has to say. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've got a little bit to get through this morning, so um, I'm going to do it as quick as I can. I'm going to press on. Um, you know, I, d I d did want to apologise actually for last week because I know last week's sermon went on quite a while. These two subjects that we've had to deal with on these two occasions have been a lot packed into them. We're trying to get through an awful lot of material, you know, here in a short amount of time. I'm sure you guys don't want to be looking at the attributes of God for a year, dear. So you know, we are trying to just plough through some of this stuff, but it's important that we do that. And that's what we've been doing. For those of you that are new this morning, we've been looking at the attributes of Almighty God. We've been on a discovery and a journey of discovering who God is. We've been spending time contemplating the qualities, the features, the inherent characteristics of God. Hallelujah. Who is God? How can we understand his ways more well, these are important questions and they're only answered when we get to know the nature, the character and the attributes of God. You see, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. In other words, when you have a, a healthy knowledge of God, of who God is, when you have a biblical knowledge of who God is, the Bible promises that you will have insight, that you will have wisdom, that you will know how to act in a certain decision, that you will know how to be successful in the plan and purpose that God has for your life. Hallelujah. The Bible also says in Daniel 11.32, the people who know their God shall be strong and they shall carry out great exploits. Amen. You know what? Being great in God, being strong in God, isn't about how wise you are in your own strength. It's not about how much you think you know it all, but it's about how much you know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about how much you know the Father. And in order to know the Father, we can know him through Jesus, but we need to get to know him through the attributes of God. You know, when we do this, we're far less likely to give up on God when the going gets tough. When we're going through it, when we're having a difficult time in life, we're more likely to hang on if we have a healthy foundation and knowledge of who God is. We know that the storm will pass. We know that if we're patient and we're patient like God is patient, then we'll know that he's only disciplining us and that joy will come in the morning. Amen. That's why we need a healthy knowledge of God. You know, my joy... My success in the plan of God and my security over my salvation and actually how I'm securing myself doesn't come from what I've achieved or what I've done. It doesn't come about it don't come through how well I speak or how charismatic I am on a on a pulpit. My joy, my security, my success in life comes from knowing Him. Amen. It comes from knowing Jesus Christ. So on that Point. Let's get straight into the Word of God. Isaiah 45, verse 10, verse 1 to 10. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings and to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. 
that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, though you do not know me. Wow. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. Shower, O heavens, from above and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who formed it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to a father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Wow. Here we have a very, very staggering piece of scripture that some of us might find quite challenging this morning. Some things that we might not have assumed about who God is. I mean, especially in a modern Western Christian uh, church. Amen. I mean, if you ask them in China, they might not really have a problem with some of this. But some of our cultural things that we, you know, we like to be very individualistic. We like to think we're in the control of our own destiny. We like to think we should have our vote on absolutely everything, right? Because we live in a, a democracy and all that stuff. I'm not saying that stuff's wrong in and of itself. But some of these things here, what we're taught of in church especially, might stagger us a little bit. And what I'm talking about this morning is I'm talking about the sovereignty of Almighty God. You see, you might disagree with some things that are in this passage. You might want to kind of, you know, do gymnastics we like to say at Bible college with a particular verse of scripture and try and make it say something that you want it to say. But I want to tell you today that this is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. It has no error in it. And if we're really going to take God seriously and take his word seriously, then we're going to need to take the sovereignty of almighty God seriously. D, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the attributes of God. We've looked at the incommunicable attributes, which basically means uh, we've, those attributes, those characteristics of God that cannot be transmitted to the creature. In other words, they're not given to us, they're not invested into us. These attributes include independency. God is independent, self-sufficient. He's eternal. We're not eternal in and of ourselves. He's unchanging, amen. We are changing, we are growing, we are developing. We then looked at God's intellectual attributes last week, namely his knowledge, his foreknowledge of all future events. He predestinates, amen. And we also looked at his wisdom. Hallelujah, which is the crowning glory of all that knowledge that God has. And this leads us this morning into a category, an attribute with a category of its own. And I'm talking about the attributes of the sovereignty of God. You see, this truth is explicitly expressed by Isaiah the prophet in our passage today. He says, thus says the Lord to his anointed, Cyrus. Wow. Wow. I mean, who would have thought it? You mean King Cyrus, a pagan king, was anointed by God? You know what? Some of the Bible commentators and theologians, they actually say that Cyrus was a type of Messiah. In that God used him to bring salvation to the Jewish people who were in Babylonian exile after King Nebuchadnezzar had been defeated. I mean, try and get your head around that for a minute. Try and just grasp that with me a minute. King Cyrus... This is a pagan king. And God has said that he's anointed him. A man who, according to the text, is an unbeliever. Yeah, he's not a child of God. He has no relationship with God. And yet God declared from the beginning that he would raise him up and use him as a vessel, as a tool, to use Andrew's language and all his construction and stuff. 
to use this man who didn't know him as a tool to bring about his sovereign purpose in all the earth. It's by his God-given authority that Cyrus had. It's by that God-given authority that Cyrus reigns and accomplishes great things. This is what is meant by the phrase, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. God's the one who opens doors, whether you know him or not. <laughs> Amen. All things come from him. Hallelujah. And then God declares that all of this is ultimately for the sake of his servant Jacob, for Israel, his chosen I want to tell you today that Cyrus' success is not for his own sake, but it's a means to a greater end, which is to glorify God through saving his people. And this is why God calls Cyrus by name, even though Cyrus didn't know him. Do we find that a bit surprising today? Does that stagger you today? What does that, how does that inform your view of government today, of kings today? Nothing happens by accident. God is completely in control. He's not fell off his throne. He is the sovereign. Amen. Amen. So the prophet goes on. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. We should just worship at that one verse. I could just go home now and we could, we could just worship and just be overcome and broken and humbled by the greatness of almighty God. I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you. Though you do not know me. Wow. I mean, I think a lot of us think, well, man, if you want to be equipped by God, then you need to get to know him. Well, this text would tell us that is not the case. You see, this is that people would know God. This is that people would know him from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides the Lord. He is the only God. Amen. That's why this is declared here. So that you today could read this prophecy, right? And you could look in history and think, wow, that prophecy came true. This is the true and living God. Amen. He's not left us without evidence that he is the only true God. And then this next verse here, which I think probably does probably challenge some of our ideas and we probably disagree with it at face value. The Lord says this through his prophet. For I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Wow. Wow. I form light. I create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I mean, that's a bit controversial, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure, you know part of me is thinking man some people might not come back to church after hearing this word but I'm telling you I'm not here to pander to people I'm here to worship God and I see preaching as the way that God has called me to worship him I stand in the presence of one right now and declare this word of God to you but this is what the text says it's controversial isn't it God creates your well-being but he also creates your calamity I mean that's that's tough isn't it I mean are we okay with that are we okay with that as, as human beings, as people made in the image of God? I think many today would ob object to such a God, if I'm quite honest with you. But if we believe the Bible to be in the inerrant, infallible word of God, if we believe God to be who he says he is, if we believe in him and we take him seriously, if we have a God who is the biblical God of scripture, and we've not just made up some nice God that we think like, that's, that's what God is, because that's what I think God is, and... God's just like a, a really good version of Stephen on a good day. Like he's just a nice guy. You know, he's just going to bless me. He don't want to know what, you know, if that's what we, we need to take God serious and we need to know what the scripture says about who God is. Now, some of you might be struggling with this teaching and I want to say to you today that you need to come to terms with this. What I'm saying here is that I don't just want to be controversial. As your pastor, I care about you. I love you. I want what's best for you. I want you to have a biblical view of God so that you're strong, amen, so that you can be successful, so that we can be confident to take this world for Jesus, amen. And But that means we need to understand this, this truth because I believe that this is the bedrock to a healthy disciple in Jesus, a sovereignty of Almighty God. It changed my life when I came to know this and I did everyone's heading for about a year just telling everybody about it preaching to everybody and uh, 
Yeah, you know, don't give an evangelism, don't give an evangelist um, some tough meat like this because he'll, um, you know, everyone has to know about it. But um, some of us are struggling with this this morning, and I'm aware of that, and I'm sensitive to that. Um, I mean, just let's just think about it a minute. Is God the author of evil? I mean, this really does uh, apply to the philosophical argument, the problem of evil, the existence of God, you know. Is God the, the author of evil? Well, it, I want to help you with that. You see, that's what I'm here for. I'm your pastor. I'm here to help you with these philosophical and ethical questions such as this. You see, the word darkness and light, well, these are simply metaphors, right, that, that, that basically convey adverse and prosperous events in our life. So when we're going through difficult times, and when we're going through good times, uh, valleys and, and mountains, amen? The highs and the lows, to use, uh, say that. Um, but <laughs> to use a, a thing for my drug addict life, yeah, yeah, the highs and the lows. But the truth is, is that God isn't the author of evil in terms of sin and guilt, right? God doesn't cause sin, he doesn't cause guilt. That is a fallen human attribute. But God is the author of evil. Whoop! Sounds like heresy. Heresy alert. No, no, just, just, just stay with me. God is the author of evil in terms of punishment, judgment, and discipline. And what do I mean by that? God is the author of evil, like difficult circumstances, that are sent to punish a wicked and corrupt world, that are sent to bring temporal judgments that convey the final judgment that is to come. Amen. God, but, but, but God is also the author of evil in terms of discipline to his children. That's what the language is meaning there. So when you're going through a tough time, God's trying to teach you patience, or he's trying to teach you something about him, right? It's not that God is judging you, but he has orchestrated that situation to teach you, to discipline you as a father disciplines a child. Amen? So, so I, I, I'm sure we're all, all okay with that this morning, aren't we? We're all okay with that. You see, what God meant, he, he, I just, do you know what? Whatever it be, we need to learn to thank God for difficult times. Because we don't know what it's achieving. It is achieving a far greater glory than what we can imagine. And do you know what? It's going to bless us. It's going to change us. I've been through hell for the last three years. And I'm telling you now, when I look inside myself, I don't recognize myself anymore. I've, there's been a lot of things that have just been taken off me. And I thank God for that. I want to say to you today, this is consistent with the whole of Scripture. It's not just in this text. That actually God forms well-being and calamity. A lot of us think, well, no, he only, he only forms well-being. It's the devil who does all the calamity stuff. Yeah, but the devil's created by God. Yeah, The devil is a tool of God, just like Cyrus is in this text. I'm talking about famine. I'm talking about barrenness. I'm talking about pestilence, war. All the calamities that we see on the face of the earth... They are all ordained by God. They are all allowed by God. They are all brought about by God to serve his greater purpose in which sometimes we do not understand why he is doing what he's doing. I mean, we not only need to look at the book of Exodus, the plagues that befell the people of Egypt. Yeah, they were sent by the Lord to deliver his people from bondage. Amen. As judgment on Pharaoh. We might want to look at the book of Revelation. Many of us in here love the book of Revelation. Look at all those plagues and famines and things that are poured out there, sent by God. Amen. Nothing is an accident. And then even if we turn to Habakkuk 3, 3, 5, you don't need to go there, but I'm just going to read it to you. It says that God's splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays of flashes from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence. And plague followed at his heels. I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, what does that scripture, how does that scripture inform you if you were COVID-19? Yeah? Is it, you know, is it all just some accident that God didn't see coming? Or is God doing something through coronavirus? Hallelujah. You see, God raises up evil rulers. He raises up evil kings, evil governments to discipline his people and to judge those who do not know him. I mean, this is evident from various places in Scripture. I mean, we might want to look at Pharaoh. Pharaoh was raised up by God, amen, so that God could demonstrate his mighty power. But also, King Solomon, 
There's two places in 1 Kings where it says that God raised up opposing kings to uh, make war with Solomon. Amen? Because Solomon was living out of the purpose of God. You see, God raises up evil men at times. And that's something that we need to come to terms with as followers of Jesus Christ. But it's important to remember this. God doesn't inspire people with evil. Yeah? He doesn't actually put evil desires in people. The evil is already there. The sinfulness is already there. The wickedness, the hatred, all of that stuff, it's there. And all God has to do really is just allow them to do as their heart wants them to do. That is it. So he doesn't inspire them with evil, but he uses their already sinful hearts for the purpose of disciplining his people, the church, to a greater good and to punish the wicked ultimately. Hallelujah. I want to tell you today that this is the God of Scripture. You see, the proverb is quite clear. The king's heart is like water in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he wills. That should lead you to pray for your parliament. Pray for your kings. Their hearts are in the hand of the God. And all of a sudden, at any time, he can just turn it. We need to be a praying people. Amen. We need to pray for our leaders. The Bible also says in Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap. And I love this. But every decision is from the Lord. Wow. Things that look like luck and chance to us are predestined and ordained by God. I mean, think about that. You roll the dice. And it's every answer is from the Lord in heaven. Wow. He's directing it. Do you know what? When I think about that, I think that's why gambling must have never worked for me. Because I used to try gambling. I've tried it a few times, but I'm just like, man, I always, end, I always lose. I never win. I've, never, I've not been a very lucky person in my life. Although some people might differ here in my testimony, in my story. But um, no, I, I believe it. I believe if you are chosen by God, see, some of these things ain't going to work for you because God has got a better plan, a purpose. So let us therefore receive this doctrine uh, into our hearts, that God alone is the author of all events prosperous and adverse they're all sent by him even though he uses the actions of men no, we're not discounting that but he does this so no one may attribute anything to fortune to look to the sovereign hand mighty God who directs all it's for this reason that the prophet goes on to say woe to him who strives with him who forms a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or, this work has no handles on it. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? To a woman, what are you? This image of the potter and clay is a common illustration for God's sovereignty over his created people. And I think there's probably some of us who are probably maybe thinking that question out aloud this morning. But the truth is, is that God as the creator has the right to do whatever he pleases, creatures that he has made. And this is the illustration that Paul picks up in Romans 9. So let's turn there quickly. We're going to jump to Romans 9. And I'm going to finish off here. This incredible passage of scripture. This is a passage of scripture that probably some of us might hear might kind of think, oh, we don't understand what that means. It's all very difficult to understand. I used to think that as well until I come to realize the absolute sovereignty of God and then it all just made perfect sense. And I realized that it's very clear what it's teaching. We just have a problem accepting it. So we try to make it say something that it's not saying. Here we have it, Romans 9, one of my favorite pieces of scripture. It just glorifies God so much. Verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the Roman church. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ. For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are the Israelites, and to whom belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. 
Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. This is what the promise said. At this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You'll say to me, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is moulded say to its moulder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honourable use and another vessel for dishonourable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not only from the Gentiles, not only from the Jews, sorry, but from Oxford, from Britain, and all the nations of the world. God bless his word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I mean, here we have a very, very controversial piece of scripture. If you go to our Bible college, it's very, very controversial to talk about this scripture. But I'm, I don't know about you, I'm one of them people, when I, when I became a Christian and when I went to Bible college, I thought, I have to understand it, Lord. If I'm going to be a pastor, if I'm going to be a teacher, I have to know the truth. I'm not just going to sit there and just teach something that I think the text is saying. I spent a lot of time seeking God in prayer, about a year actually, seeking God in prayer, reading loads of books, studying the word, like, you know, and I wanted to know. And God gave me a revelation from heaven, without a doubt. And from that day, I was transformed. It was like I got saved all over again. It was incredible. The fact is that this text is talking, it's, there's basically an argument taking place. I don't know if you noticed that. Paul saying some things and then there's a response an objection to what Paul's saying he anticipates that whatever you might be thinking today well if God's absolutely sovereign what about this what about that I mean does that make God unfair that's exactly what Paul is anticipating the question is going to be asked when teaching this fundamental doctrine of scripture you see for Paul he just delivered that incredible promise of God in the previous chapter of Romans 8 we looked at it last week didn't we about the, uh, the assurance of salvation for those who believe in Jesus Christ that God is in control that he will, will finish the work in us that all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose if God before us who can be against us for those he predestined he called and those he called he justified and those he justified he glorified Hallelujah, past tense, it's done, it's accomplished. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. But then this brought some questions, more questions and answers to the Jewish people. They were saying, well, you know, if this is true, if salvation is accomplished, if it's sure, then why are there Jewish people who have been judged by God? Why are there Jewish people who have not been saved? Surely, Paul. That means that what you're saying isn't true, that salvation can be lost, that it's not completely the work and promise of God. And it's important to notice where Paul begins in answering that objection, because that's what he's doing in Romans 9. He doesn't start with the mind and loads of theology, and I'm going to try and argue with you and win, a, win an argument. 
No, he starts with the heart. Yeah? You see, Paul's a thinker and a doer. He's not fatalistic. He's not thinking, well, if, let it be, it's meant to be that the Jews are damned and, you know, and if God's in control, he'll work it all out in the end and I have nothing to worry about. That's not Paul's thinking here. No, Paul has great sorrow. He has unceasing anguish in his heart. He's broken, wishing that he himself would be damned so that his brothers, the Jews, would be saved. That is challenging. I want to ask you today, do you have that heart? Can you honestly say to God, Lord, send me to hell so that my parents can be saved? That is a prayer. And it tells us something about the apostles' hearts. It was for Christ's sake and for his Jewish brothers and sisters. He wants to do all that he can to reach out to those who don't know Jesus Christ. And that leads me to objection number one. I'm just going to deal with a, just, just a, three objections um, as we draw towards the finish here of sovereignty and predestination. Because there, it is sometimes difficult for us to understand. I don't need to quote just yet, bro. Thanks. So objection number one. If God is sovereign, why preach the gospel? Yeah? If God is in control and he's going to save his, his elect, his people, and, you know, he, he's just doing it all, why preach the gospel? I mean, it's pointless, right? Well, I want to say, Paul seemed to think it was very necessary, actually. You see, this same Paul, well, he's the one who wrote, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, there's a chosen people within the nation of Israel. There's a people who are saved and called by Jesus Christ. Not many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. And it's these people who are the true Israelites. Not according to flesh, but according to spirit, in which we are all part of that Israel of God. Galatians 6.16 And then Paul goes on. That though they were not yet born and had done neither, nothing either good nor bad, in order that God's purpose of election might stand, Sarah was told that the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Very tough, very tough for us to, for us to grapple with that. Then it says that God has mercy on whom he has mercy. He has compassion on whom he has compassion. And so then it depends not on human will, not on free will, not on willpower or exertion or effort, but it depends ultimately on God who has mercy. He has mercy on whom every wills and he hardens every wills. That's what Paul's saying here. But then the same Paul in Romans 10 says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? In other words, someone's got to go. Someone's got to preach the gospel. Someone's got to make disciples of all nations. There's a calling, there's a mandate on all of our lives. This is not Greek fatalism. Even though God predestines, he predestines us to go. He empowers us to go, to be full of the Holy Spirit and to declare the gospel to every creature under heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're part of this. God ordains the means that lead to the end, which is the salvation of people. You see, for Paul, the urgency of the gospel is absolutely paramount. It must be spoken. It must be declared. And this is the way that God has chosen to glorify himself through saving sinners. You see, God's sovereign predestination in saving people, it should liberate us, right? And I really want you to get this. It should liberate you. It should empower you. And it should encourage you as Christians. It should encourage you to reach out and to lift up. It should encourage you to preach the gospel. I mean, if God is sovereign, and he can save anybody. Yeah, he can save a drug addict. He can save Paul who was persecuting Christians. He could save Adolf Hitler. Amen. God can save anyone. He can change anyone's heart. He is the sovereign. Hallelujah. I mean, this is helpful stuff, isn't it? This is exciting. This, is, this should make you enthusiastic. Do you know what George Whitfield said? Oh, people don't realize all my zeal comes from my knowledge of the sovereignty of God. I want to say I agree with that. When I came to know God and his sovereignty and his predestination, my life set me on fire. This is a God who can do anything. Hallelujah. And we are in his hands. 
You see, if you know that God has a destiny for you, if you know that God has a purpose for your life, it's exciting. It makes you want to get up in the morning, amen? It makes you want to just, what's God going to do to me? God's got me on a mission. Who am I going to meet? How am I going to see God move? Do you know what I mean? He's going to show up and show off in someone's life radically, and I want to see it. But there's many people out there today, they're living purposeless. They're living without a sense of destiny. They think atheism is true. They think we came from monkeys and they ultimately just believe in the natural physical world. It's it's all a random cosmic accident. We need to be a people who live with a sense of destiny and purpose. A reason for being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if you know that God has chosen you from before the creation of the world, you know his heart is for you. And it's not going to turn from you. Amen. Do you know what? This theology, it, it, it gives you sleep on an hour. You can just sit. Spurgeon said the sovereignty of God is a pillow in which I rest my head. He found great peace, great security. Anxiety goes. Stress levels go down. We don't worry about turning on God. We don't worry about God turning his back on us. But we then start, which frees us up and liberates us to think about other people. To think about God more, it takes the eyes off of ourselves. You know, when you know that God has a destiny for you, you can walk confidently through life as a victorious saint. Amen? So why preach the gospel if God is sovereign? I want to say to you, why not preach the gospel if God is sovereign? If he can save anyone, if he can change any heart, why not preach the gospel? Then objection two. Some people say, well, if God is sovereign, why pray? Because it's already written, it's already ordained, it's already done. Well, yeah, it does say that in Psalm 139, that he wrote all of our days before there was ever one of them. So, I think that's a crazy question, to be honest, because you're arguing with the Bible. But, um, why pray if God is sovereign? Why not pray? Amen? If he's absolutely sovereign, if he can do anything, if he can change any art, if he can bring about circumstances, and he's ultimately in control... That makes me want to pray even more. Because I know that he can do anything. He can move mountains. He can change the heart of governments. He can do absolutely anything. He can open doors that no man can shut. He can cause people to be raised from the dead. He can heal the sick. He can do anything. Our God is mighty. Hallelujah. And do you know what? When we pray according to the Holy Spirit, John 15, when we abide in him and we pray according to his will, with his spirit in us, we pray according to the will of God which is the will of God that has been predestined before the foundation of the world. We need to come in agreement with God in prayer. This is what Paul, sorry, Job says in, in Job 42.2. I know that you can do all things that no purpose of yours can be But then some of you are saying, and we are coming to a finish now, if you want to come up, Tom. Some of, us are, some of you are saying here, Stephen, the big problem that I have with predestination is what about my loved ones? What about my family members? Those who don't know Jesus. Are you seriously saying to me, Stephen, that God doesn't love them? God doesn't care for them because he's not saved them? Well, I just say to that, to be honest, I'd be more concerned with your loved ones and your family members. I'd be more concerned about my family if it was just down to their decision. There'd be no hope in them coming. They don't want Jesus. But when I know that God can override the free will, that he can override any decision, that he can take the heart of stone out and put a heart of flesh in, when I know that God can write his laws on anyone, I know and I have faith and hope and I pray for my family earnestly, knowing that God can raise the dead. Hallelujah. You know, that was the case for me. I was a drug addict for 10 years. I was a career criminal. I've nearly died five times. One time I did die. I'd been out, in and out of prison. You name it, the lot. Crack cocaine, heroin, alcoholism. Do you know what my grandma used to say to me when I was a naughty boy at school? You're going to know God. My grandma used to say to me as a teenager when I was on drugs, Stephen's going to be on fire when he comes to know Jesus. And he used to be like, I don't want anything to do with God. What are you? You're crazy. You're mad. They prayed for me earnestly. I hated God. I ran from all my life. God got me. Amen. Just as he got the apostle Paul. Hallelujah. A man who hated Christ. So let's be a people who pray for our family. You see, I'm sure Jesus once said, with man, these things are impossible. God, all things are possible. And he's talking about salvation there. You know, the Jew says, who can be saved, Lord? 
Jesus said, this is impossible with man. God, all things possible. And the final one that I want to draw your attention to, number three. But if God chooses some for salvation and not others, isn't that a bit unfair? Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. You know, some of you think that that verse there sounds quite unfair, quite unjust, and so does the person who Paul is anticipating who's going to argue back with him. But let me just say that this is the response that Paul gives. He has mercy whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Some of us have a real difficult time in dealing with that idea that God hardens hearts. It doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem loving. But I mean, one way to kind of understand this really is, number one, we are inherently sinful. We don't need hardening. We come into this world with hard hearts. If our hearts are softened, we thank God for that. Amen. But just to illustrate this idea before of how God does harden hearts, have you ever come across someone in your life who they've just chosen from day one, they're going to be your enemy and they just hate you and they're just going to work against you? We all know that, don't we? We live in a fallen world. I'm sure we've all experienced that. It doesn't matter how much you bless that person, how kind you are, how generous you are, how loving you are to them. The more you do it, the more they hate you. <laughs> we've experienced that, haven't we? Me and Chloe have had quite, a lot, quite had our fair share of that stuff, haven't we? This is what it's like with God. This is what it was like with Pharaoh. God's warning Pharaoh, please re re release the Jews, all this stuff. And Pharaoh is just getting more and more angry and more and more hardened as time goes on. You know, the Puritan, one of the Puritans once said, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. That is the case. It really does depend on the condition of the heart in which the response that is given. Will it harden? Will it soften? These other things that happen so according to Paul some of us start to judge God don't we I mean why does he find fault who can resist his will it's not fair I mean how can you do that God I want to say to you today as a close it's only unfair if you didn't receive something that you earned but we know that we didn't earn what we have received in Jesus it's a free gift. Jesus done it all. God's part is saving. Our part is sinning. We do nothing. Jesus does everything. Our works add nothing to God's work because God plus anything equals nothing. Amen? So if you start with God at the center of human history, it's amazing to think that he has adopted you and called you by name. That he doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. I mean, to be honest, I don't really know why. I'm just, just going to finish really just by speaking to you from my heart. I don't really know why we have, a tr we have trouble with God choosing and deciding what happens. You see, he's God, we're not. But you know, when I look at my life, every problem that I had in my life had this one factor in them. Me. Every problem, every issue, every trouble had me involved. That's because nothing good has ever come from me. Even since I've come to know Jesus Christ, I can tell you all the times that I've failed him. And yet he keeps calling me. He keeps loving me. He keeps giving me second chances. This is the God whom we worship. Gracious, kind and generous. You know what? He's relentless. I don't like the song Reckless Love, I don't like the word reckless, but I like the theology that it sings. It should have been called the relentless love of God, because that's who God is. He is relentless. Shall we stand to our feet? We're going to close in worship.